9 to 10. That is page 703 in your pew Bible. Remember the former things of old, for I am the for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end of the beginning of the beginning from the beginning. And from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. The last three services have been uh, about God the Creator, kind of in a progression. The first one was about uh, God the Creator of the universe, and as amazing as our universe is, and as how perfect it has been created to uh, support life, complex life, and for us to visualize it and learn about it, um, the creation of life itself is even more complicated. It's uh, almost unimaginably more complicated, even the singlest living cell in the entire universe. And then as complicated as life is, there's one other thing, at least that I'm aware of, that's uh, more difficult to explain than the creation of life. At least on some level, we humans are able to create complex things. We're able to create very complex mechanical things, machinery, um, you know, cell phones, computer systems, jet engines, amazingly complex machines that are in some ways similar to certain features of living things as far as the mechanical aspect is concerned. However, who do you know who can create even a minute of time? Right? Anybody you know who can create? If I could create a minute of time, you know how wealthy I would be? If I even knew a minute into the future, I would be a gazillionaire. So, this is God's claim to fame, sort of. Again, our text for today. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Not even a little bit. God has given us ability to be like Him in our creative ability. We are creators. We are able to create things, all kinds of different things. But this is one thing we cannot do, and so God references it as to an example of something we are not like at all. So he says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. In other words, I can see the future perfectly because I'm there. Right? I say, my purposes will stand, I will do what I please. How many of us can say that? We, can, we don't know even if we're going to be alive tomorrow. Right? I don't know if I'm going to make it till this afternoon. Right? I don't know if my purposes will stand or not. But God knows for sure, and that's something unique about him. He references that about himself. Then he says, he asks the question, who, who then is like me? Even a little bit like me in this regard. It's nobody. Let him proclaim it, let him declare and lay out before me what has happened since I established my ancient people, and what is yet to come. Yet, yes, let him foretell what will to come, right? Now there's a lot of prophets out there like Nostradamus and whatever. Those guys... They're just guessing, right? They, don't, they are notoriously bad guessers. Anybody hear of what's called the uh, butterfly effect? It's a little flapping of the butterfly in East Indonesia can cause a hurricane in Florida, right? Over a few year period. In other words, the farther we go out in time, the less we know, because there's so many complicating factors about it. Only somebody who creates time or who's there all the time uh, can actually know these things. He says, and then God says, do not tremble, I know. Do not be afraid, I've got it all taken care of. I'm there, I've done that, I know what's going to happen. Did I not proclaim and foretell this long ago? I got it all in control, right? I know, but nothing surprises me, right? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? Anybody else who can do this? No, there is no other rock. I know not one, right? And if you can show me, go ahead and bring it up, right? So it's God's absolutely unique list, his main claim to fame again. No one but God is able to create even a little bit in the fourth dimension. Right? We've got three dimensions, length, you know, up, down, sideways, you know, three dimensions. And then time. Time is how you are able to move and do stuff, right? So Jesus even points this out in Luke 12, 25. He says, 
Who of you, by warning, can add a single hour to his life? <laughs> huh? Nobody? So, anyway, he says, again, no one but God is able to know. I'm talking about know the future, like a fact. It's, begin, it's been given to us to know the past, because we, God has given us a memory, and we can kind of extrapolate based on the past, but we cannot really know the future. We can only predict based on past experience. And the only reason why we can really predict is because God has supernaturally made the universe a predictable place with repeatable patterns and cyclic patterns. Things happen over and over again. Yesterday the sun came up. I think that today the sun came up and maybe tomorrow the sun will come up too, right? Because it's a cyclic pattern, right? We'll talk about cycles in a little bit. Again, I'd be filthy rich if I could know for sure one minute into the future. You know how fast the stock market changes? Right? So, and then he refers to himself. He uses this, this interesting two-word phrase. He calls himself the I am. Now, a lot of people think this is allegorical, like a figure of speech. But the Bible doesn't refer to it as such, and God doesn't refer to himself as such either. He, call, he uses the phrase literally. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Right? In other words, a past tense compared with a present tense. He says, Abraham past, I am there. Right? He uses a present tense term. He says, I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. How could he say that, that I am the end, if he really wasn't there and didn't know for sure what the end was? Right? Before you were born, the I am knew you and what you would do. For example, in Jeremiah 1.5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Before you were even thought of. Right? That's amazing. He says, also in David, in Psalms 139.16, David says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's amazing. This is not a description of someone who is not outside of our time frame of reference. Also, this is an amazing passage. Ellen White describes the death of Moses, and I just thought there's no other way to impress upon you this concept except to read portions of this passage. She says, Moses, at the time of his death, was permitted to look down the stream of time and to behold the first advent of our Savior. He saw Jesus as a babe in Bethlehem. He heard the voices of an angelic host break forth in the glad song of praise to God and of peace on earth. He beheld in the heavens the star guiding the wise men of the east to Jesus. He beheld Christ's humble life in Nazareth, his ministry of love and sympathy and healing, his rejection by a proud, unbelieving nation. Again, this is all hundreds of years before Christ was born. Moses saw Jesus upon all of it, as with weeping he bade farewell to the city of his love. He followed the Savior to Gethsemane. He beheld the agony in the garden, the betrayal, the mockery, the scourging, the crucifixion. He heard Christ's agonizing cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He saw him lying in Joseph's new tomb. The darkness of hopeless despair seemed to enshroud the world, but he looked again and beheld him coming forth as conqueror and ascending to heaven, escorted by adoring angels and leading a multitude of captives. He saw the shining gates open to receive him and the host of heaven with songs of triumph, welcoming their commander. And it was there revealed to him that he himself, Moses, would be the one who should attend the Savior and open to him the everlasting gates. This was all hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. Thousands of years, right? And now Moses knows that he's going to be the one. Still in the future, hasn't happened yet. He's going to be the ones when Christ takes us all home. Moses is going to be there at the gates, opening them for Christ. Isn't that cool? Oh, this is in Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, 476 to 477. I trimmed out a lot. So it's worth going and reading for yourself if you get the chance. But these are fantastic claims, right? Fantastic claims don't necessarily mean that they're true. So where's the evidence? And it needs to be pretty fantastic, right? Fantastic claims demand fantastic evidence. Well, there is some pretty fantastic evidence, and it comes in at least two basic forms. One form is biblical prophecy, and the other is cycles of time that are evident in nature, in all of nature. So the first is prophecy. Prophecy is considered by the, by the biblical authors themselves to be the ultimate form of evidence. 
more, more reliable than personal experience. Whatever you see and feel and touch, everybody thinks that's solid, right? That's empirical evidence. That's science, right? But no, according to the biblical authors, they say prophecy is the best empirical evidence that you can come across. For example, 2 Peter 1, 16 through 19, Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there, we did that, we did, you know, we did that, right? For we, he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, in other words, God the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard, right? When we were with him in the holy mount. But we have also a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, he says, we were there, we touched, we felt, we saw, we did all these things. I know it happened, you know. But let me tell you, you know, don't believe me. Don't take my word for it. We've got a prophecy book here that is amazing. Let me, there's, there are 300 prophecies in reference to just the birth of Christ alone. Uh, so we obviously don't have time to go into very many of these things. But I'm going to give you just one prophetic example to illustrate you, to you the amazing power of prophecy and how it is extremely hard to argue against uh, the divine origin of prophecy in the Bible. One example is David, Daniel's prophecy of the succession of kingdoms. Here, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and in this dream he saw a statue. We won't go into the full detail of the story, but you can read it. Da Daniel chapter 2. The head was King Nebuchadnezzar, it was made of gold. It specifically says, you are the head of gold, right, in the Bible. Then next came the chest and arms of silver, uh, which represented Medo-Persia. Again, specifically in the Bible, the angel says, Medo-Persia is the uh, chest of silver, and the arms of silver. Then came the belly and thighs of brass. And then again, the angel specifically says the brass represents, or that region of time represents Greece. And uh, specifically mentions a single king, which we'll get into. And then the legs of iron represent Rome. The angel doesn't specifically mention Rome by name, but uh, we can see uh, other evidences that it has to be Rome. And then, of course, the feet are mixed with iron and clay, and they don't cleave to each other. So let's look a little bit this more. Piece, this is just a little video clip I think you'll be interested in. It kind of leads into this concept. This piece chronicles events from 605 to 594 BC, including Nebuchadnezzar's campaign into Palestine and the first capture of Jerusalem. Uh, after, of course, consulting his own god, he's told that these metals represent a sequence of various kingdoms and Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that you O king are this head of gold the head of gold represents Babylon and that's very appropriate that that be the symbol for Babylon which was gilded in gold famous for its gold Babylon was one of the most spectacular cities of the ancient world if you look at the size of Babylon it was larger than Rome larger than Athens. It was just an enormous city that was situated just about 25 miles south of Baghdad in modern Iraq. Historians tell us that there was more gold in Babylon, and probably they're using hyperbole, but you can get a feel for the richness of ancient Babylon, that there was more gold in Babylon than there was dust. It was the great golden kingdom of antiquity. Excavations that have taken place there beginning in 1899 by the Germans have revealed a city that was surrounded by triple walls. The walls of Babylon consisted of actually two systems of walls. And they surrounded the city and these two systems, each one consisted of three separate walls. So you had a total of six walls surrounding the whole city. It was massive. There were over 200 pagan temples the famous ziggurat, of course, was the central uh, temple, uh, and many gods were worshipped. Nebuchadnezzar built many altars, temples, sanctuaries, um, and it was a very polytheistic society, a very sophisticated society. The literature and the language was something that, at that time, the Akkadian language was basically the lingua franca of the world, like English is today. 
anyone doing commerce, anyone doing any kind of diplomatic relations would be communicating in that language. And so the Babylonian Empire not only spread, but it was very influential as well. This, uh, this is a whole series, like a five CDs, if you're interested, called The Forgotten Dream. Um, but they start out with the uh, uh, image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the vision and what the, each of these uh, metals represent in sequence. And then if you go to Daniel chapter 7, it does exactly the same sequence, but with animals, and it gives further details about what these kingdoms would do. Four different animals, four different kingdoms. The first animal was the winged lion. It represented, again, uh, New Babylon, um, which was governed by Nebuchadnezzar. The lopsided bear, which was higher on one side than the other, with three ribs in its mouth, represented Neo-Persia. And the four-headed leopard with four wings represented Greece under Alexander the Great, to start out with. And then the ten-horned beast with iron teeth represented Rome. So, if you don't believe me, go and read Daniel 7 said the first kingdom was like a lion and it had wings of an eagle and I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted up from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man and the heart of a man was given to it. In other words, the Babylonian leadership would decline in power and bravery over time. In other words, they would no longer have a heart of a lion like Nebuchadnezzar did as his successors took over. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar didn't like this and that's why he built his entire image of gold, but again, prophecy held true. Lopsided bear with three ribs, represented Medo-Persia. The reason why it was lopsided is because the Median Empire came first, it was an ancient empire. However, the Persians kind of took over, but they respect, out of respect for the Median, the historicity of the Median Empire, uh, the Persian kings kind of uh, incorporated a lot of the Median leaders into their government and also some of their customs. Uh, the three ribs represent uh, Persia conquering Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. Um, Persia was not as, it wasn't that like gold, it was inferior like silver, uh, because it adopted a lot of the government. It was a new kingdom, right? Because the Persian kingdom was kind of barbaric. And so they didn't really have organized government. They didn't really have well-formed laws or history behind them. And so they adopted the government and culture of Babylon. Um, they were larger in size, but they weren't as, as luxurious as Babylon w was during its time. Cyrus, the king of Persia, although Darius the Mede conquers Babylon, uh, he does so under the overall rulership of Cyrus, the Persian king. So he's kind of a vassal king, Darius under the Persian king. And what's interesting about Cyrus in particular is that Isaiah mentions the name and what Cyrus would do 150 years before he was born. Uh, here's what Isaiah says about Cyrus. It says, uh, uh, speaking for God, Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. And we know that happened historically, outside of the Bible. We know it was Cyrus who commanded Jerusalem to be rebuilt. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name, right? 150 years before you were born. This passage was read to Cyrus. He said, hey, look, here you are mentioned by name in the scroll of Isaiah. And Cyrus was so impressed, he said, sure, immediately rebuild Jerusalem so that I can fulfill this prophecy. Right? Greece. Greece is represented by a leopard. A leopard is the fastest animal on earth. can run about 70 miles an hour, but that was not fast enough to represent Greece. Uh, so four wings were added and the vision to represent the speed of conquest of Alexander the Great. Also, it's represented by bronze on the statue, the belly and thighs of bronze, because the army of Greece was uh, known for bronze armor. By the time of Alexander the Great, the infantry, the hoplite, were about 100 pounds of bronze into battle. They were like walking tanks. 
Uh, iron, interestingly enough, uh, there's some reading on this, in Alexander's day, was considered a precious metal. You know, like, what a lovely iron brooch you're wearing today. You know? <laughs> so they didn't use it to make weapons, uh, generally speaking. They used it to polish diamonds and to make jewelry out of, surprisingly. Um, but it was not used for weaponry, and so they were known for their bronze armor, or their brass armor. Here's the Battle of Issus. This is a mosaic taken from Pompeii. Once they took all the uh, ash from the eruption there, Vesuvius, uh, they uncovered a lot of mosaics, and this is one of them. Here you see the Darius III over here. He's fleeing for his life from Alexander, who's on his horse over in the far left here. And he's uh, charging in directly at Darius, and Darius takes off and flees the battle scene. Even though Alexander is heavily outnumbered, some say by 10 to 1, he wins the battle. And then he wins another three battles after this. And so, if you look at Daniel 8, Alexander the Great is pictured as a hairy goat, and uh, Darius is pictured as a two-horned ram. And of course, the goat flies across the ground without touching the ground. So it goes with such speed and attacks the uh, ram with such ferocity, it doesn't even have a chance to touch the ground. It happens so fast. Here at Daniel 8, the angel is talking to Daniel, interpreting the vision for him. The angel says, the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. So is there any doubt? Okay. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. In other words, Alexander the Great defeats Darius at Isis in uh, 333 BC and at Guatemala in 331 BC. And the rest of the then known world in 10 years, thereabouts, give or take a few months. The four horns that replace, this is Angel talking again, the four horns that replace the one that was broken off re represent the four kingdoms that will emerge from this nation but will not have the same power. And it turns out that Alexander, when he died, his kingdom was divided up among his four generals by the name of Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. So again, prophecy fulfilled to the letter. And they were not as powerful as Alexander was. The uh, kingdom kind of fragmented. After that comes Rome, the kingdom of iron. Um, the legs of iron. Romans began to invade the eastern Mediterranean region in around the second century BC. Rome defeated Greece at the Battle of uh, Pydna at um, June 22nd, 168 BC. They crushed the nation that opposed them in the most brutal fashion in history. Uh, they were truly iron fisted in their rule. They were brutal, a brutal people for entertainment. They had just blood baths in the arena. Right? That's what they like to do, kill people. Uh, they were truly the kingdom of iron, and they suppressed the entire uh, European region with iron force. Many historians like Edward Gibbon refer to Rome as the iron monarchy, uh, arguably influenced by the Bible as such, but with no small reason. Uh, the feet of iron and clay, the angel's talking again here, he says, and whereas you saw iron mixed with miry, miry clay, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not cleave to one another, even if iron is not mixed with clay. With the seed of men, that passage indicates that men will try to make alliances among each other during this time of mixture of iron and clay through intermarriage. And it is well known that the European nations, they try to establish alliances with each other by sending their daughters and sons off to marry other kingdoms, marry within other kingdoms, so that they could support their own power. But it didn't work. Uh, as the angel said, it never succeeded. They never became powerful. So, uh, but when was Daniel really written? The critics say, of the Bible, say that these passages are so precise, so accurate, that nobody could have known them or written them ahead of time. They had to have been written after the, most of the prophecies were already fulfilled. So they had to be written during the second century BC, during the Maccabean era, um, instead of actually during the sixth century BC, during the time of Daniel. So what's the response from a Christian? How, why do we believe that it, this pa these passages were actually written during, by someone living in the time of Nebuchadnezzar II? Um, and what do we have to say to these arguments of the critics? 
Well, one argument is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is kind of interesting. They were first discovered in 1946 by a shepherd boy in the caves of, um, by the Dead Sea on the western side. The scrolls uh, date between 100 BC, or actually even earlier, but as old as 250 BC. Every book in the Old Testament was, was discovered in, the, in these caves, except for Esther. Prior to their discovery, the oldest Masoretic text dated no older than 980 years AD. So that's a big difference, over a thousand years older than our oldest manuscripts before this time. Critics had assumed that uh, since there were up to 1,700 years difference between the writing of Isaiah from the Masoretic text, there would be many differences because as you uh, pass along information, it gets changed over time. Like telephone, you know, where you play as a kid. <coughs> By the time you get to the end of the line, it's very different from when it started. Well, the same thing was assumed to happen to the Bible, that it would change or evolve over time. But it was discovered from the Dead Sea Scrolls that this did not happen. The Holy Spirit evidently protected the Bible uh, and kept it pure over time because only, there were only minor spelling mistakes between the Masoretic text and the scrolls found at the, at the Dead Sea. The style of Aramaic writing used in Daniel 2 from the Dead Sea Scrolls were also a form of language that were, was not present during the second century. It was an early form of Aramaic, like English. English changes from Old English to what we speak now. If you go read like Beowulf or something in the original English, you'll have to look up every word, like I did. This doesn't sound remotely the same, so you can tell the, the style of language, what period it, it came from. And the style of language used to write Daniel 2 predates the second century. Also, from the people, the Qumran people living in this region, they viewed these uh, books of Daniel as canonical. In other words, uh, they had already established them as scripture. And that doesn't happen overnight. It takes hundreds of years, usually, to establish a scripture as canonical scripture. Also, this is even more interesting to me. Greek historians throughout history uh, said that Nebuchadnezzar was a minor king. He wasn't really the builder of Babylon. Uh, rather, they attributed the building of Babylon to a queen named Semiramis. And they said this queen was the true builder of Babylon. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar was then viewed throughout most of modern history until the late 1800s by biblical critics and historians as a mythical figure. It wasn't until uh, cuneiform tablets and, and uh, other artifacts were discovered that mentioned Nebuchadnezzar by name that he, he was uh, realized as a true historical figure. Uh, here's the Nebuchadnezzar cylinder who talks about his father and Nebuchadnezzar on this other uh, cuneiform tablet. Uh, describing work on the Yavabar Temple. These are from the 6th century. Also, cuneiform tablets and cylinders um, confirm Nebuchadnezzar specifically as a builder of Babylon and uh, prove that Queen Semiramis was never in Babylon. Uh, she ruled uh, as a regent for her infant son Ad Adad-Niri III and uh, she never had anything to do with Babylon at all. Also, it's interesting that Babylon is a huge place, as we saw from the video clip. There are millions of bricks in Babylon, the, you know, building the, all these structures for the hanging gardens that Nebuchadnezzar made for his wife who was homesick for her ho mountainous homeland. And on each one of these groups is stamped the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And this particular brick says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, benefactor of the temples of Esagil and Ezra, Principal heir of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So every brick, boom, stamped with the name of Nebuchadnezzar. So obviously, who built what Babylon? Also, who would have known that it was Nebuchadnezzar who did this uh, outside of very modern history from the discovery of all these modern artifacts? No one could have known because all the information that was available outside of the Bible itself or these ancient texts um, was lost to history. Only the Greek historians were available and they were saying Queen Semiramis did it. So there's no way to know outside of the Bible 
who did it? How do critics deal with this? Well, here's uh, scholars basically ignore it. Here's one that actually admitted it back in 1941. Robert Pfeiffer, he writes, uh, he's from Harvard University. He says, we shall presumably never know how the author learned that the new Babylon was the creation of Nebuchadnezzar, as the excavations have proved. You know, the implications of this are very astounding because only someone living during the time of Nebuchadnezzar could have written Daniel. After that period of time, no one would have known what happened, that Nebuchadnezzar was really the founder of Babylon. Uh, there's another aspect to support that God is in charge of time, and that's the seven-day cycle, or the rhythm of life, the basic rhythm of life, for pretty much every living thing that's been studied in any detail, revolves around the seven-day week. The Bible claims, of course, that God designed it and created the seven-day week back in Genesis for our first parents. However, critics say that the seven-day week was invented by the Assyrians, by Sargon I, uh, in particular around 2300 BC. It was then passed on to the Babylonians, who then passed it on to the Jews during their captivity in Babylon during the time of Daniel, around 600 BC. Ancient Romans, not everybody observed a seven-day week, by the way. Ancient Romans observed an eight-day week. But after the adoption of the Julian calendar and during the time of Augustus, the seven-day week became uh, into use. Um, both of them, eight-day and seven-day weeks, were used at the same time. But the seven-day week became more and more popular. Secular historians also say that uh, probably the seven-day week is a rough division of the monthly lunar cycle into seven-day periods. However, the seven-day week is only 23.7% of an average lunar cycle, not 25%. So that means if it were true, it would be quickly out of phase, and you wouldn't be able to precisely map it to the lunar cycle anymore, very rapidly. Also, it's interesting to note that the Dewey Decimal System, Base 12 System, and the Sexadecimal System, or the Base 60 numerical systems, have historically been used, like by, by the Babylonians and other cultures, as the primary systems to divide calendar units up. You know, that's where we get our 360 days for the year, uh, uh, 360 degrees for a circle. You know, Babylonians. No historical or Jewish or Babylonian records suggest that these cultures define the seven-day week as a quarter of a lunation. That's not mentioned anywhere in ancient texts. So then why did the seven-day week get picked out of thin air? You know, why does the seven, also why has the seven-day week been so popular uh, in ancient culture and in modern culture as well? Why haven't some more rational uh, cycles been, uh, become popular? Like for example, the French, during the uh, bloody French Revolution, they adopted, adopted a 10-day week. Right? But it didn't last very long because nobody liked the 10-day week. I mean, by the time it's Wednesday, you still got a lot going for the weekend, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Also, a 10-day week is more close, a, clo a closer match to the lunar cycle. Uh, the lunar cycle is 29.53 days, so it's roughly a third of that cycle. But it didn't catch on. It's just that's not very popular. So the idea that the Jews adopted a seven-day week from the Babylonians during their captivity is at least partly based on the documentary hypothesis, which has been effectively falsified, but a lot of biblical critics still cite arguments from the documentary hypothesis. Um, one of the things that's been falsified about the documentary hypothesis is that writing was not invented until well after the time of Moses. So Moses couldn't possibly have written what he wrote or what the Bible says he wrote, and Daniel couldn't have written what the Bible says that Daniel wrote. Uh, however, numerous 20th, 20th century discoveries have falsified this notion, such as the discoveries of what are now known as the Ebla tablets. The Ebla tablets are, again, cuneiform tablets written about 2200 years BC. They prove that writing, even alphabetic type writing, was in existence well before Moses came on the scene some 1400 years BC. And uh, there's some statements that are interesting in these tablets that talk about, or that seem to parallel the biblical creation narrative. They're even more similar to the Genesis narrative than later examples of flood narratives. And it seems like that as one goes farther back in time, 
with narratives about creation, that the closer those narratives get to the biblical narrative. So the older you get, the closer you get to the biblical narrative. So that kind of supports the Bible as well, as far as credibility is concerned. Uh, they also mention names like Abraham and Isaac, suggesting that these names were well known and common during this ancient time, 2200 years BC. They tell of two cities, which is very interesting, Sodom and Gomorrah by name, and they mention all of the five cities in the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah, the same valley, in the same order mentioned in the Bible. Right? Again, credibility given to the Bible as a historical text. This is in the face of higher critics who had originally claimed that Sodom and Gomorrah and Ur and the other Canaanite cities of the Bible never existed. They were mythical. Again, not only were they proven to exist, but uh, they also confirmed the biblical narrative as well. It's also interesting to note that seven-day biorhythms are existence in lots of living things. There's a relatively new science that's called chronobiology. And it's discovering that these seven-day cycles or circa septum cycles are circadian rhythms that are existence in almost everything, pretty much everything that has been studied in any detail. And uh, it's difficult to explain the origin of this seven-day cycle of living things by any natural means. It almost seems like arbitrary. And here's a, a quote uh, from Susan Perry and Jen Dawson. They write, at first glance, it might seem that the weekly rhythms developed in response to the seven-day week imposed by human culture thousands of years ago. Like on your horses or your cattle, you know, you kind of, they learn the cycle, right? However, this theory doesn't hold once you realize that plants, insects, and animals other than humans also have the weekly cycle. Biology, therefore, not culture, is probably at the source of our seven-day week. Here's uh, Jeremy Campbell. Uh, he writes, Franz Halberg proposes that body rhythms of about seven days, far from being passively, passively driven by a social cycle of the calendar week, are innate, autonomous, and perhaps the reason why the calendar week arose in the first place. These circumceptions are about weekly rhythms are one of the major surprises turned up by modern chronobiology. They are of very ancient origin, appearing in primitive one-celled organisms and are thought to be present even in bacteria, the simplest forms of life now existing. And Ernst, Earnhardt Haas, he writes, um, the endogenous nature of about weekly or circuit septum rhythms is known by the occurrence of animals kept under laboratory conditions precluding circuit septum periodic input. In other words, they are isolated from any outside influence. They're, they're isolated from cycles of the moon, from light and day. They're completely controlled under laboratory conditions, and yet they exhibit this weekly seven-day pattern of rhythms. Specific examples in humans of this pattern include a seven-day cycle for the immune system, response to infections. There's a certain timing of when to administer antibiotics to make the most effective. Um, there's cycles of blood and urine chemicals blood pressure cycles on a weekly pattern. Rejection of organ transplants happens on a weekly pattern. The heartbeat has a weekly cycle. The common cold happens on a weekly cycle. Coping hormones, uh, stress hormones, general mood or the state of mind cycles on a weekly pattern. So if you can figure out your wife's weekly pattern, you know, you gotta admit. Um, there's also evidence for you dentists out there that uh, tooth enamel is modified on a weekly cycle. Also, uh, other organisms, like there's this plant algae, uh, Acetabularia algae, popularly, popular name is the wine glass. It also has a seven-day growth cycle. There's some Brazilian bees that observe a seventh-day Sabbath. Not only do they have a seven-day cycle, but they refuse to work on one day out of seven. And there's one colony actually that does it on the actual Sabbath day, on our Sabbath day. Uh, they refuse to work to go gather honey or anything. They just hang out at the hive, you know. There's also a features that there's all kinds of other circadian rhythms out there. You know, there's 24-hour uh, rhythms and there's monthly rhythms and yearly rhythms. But all these other different types of circadian rhythms seem to be tuned or respond to the seven-day rhythm in particular. It's like the conductor of an orchestra that tunes all the other rhythms of life. Jerry Campbell, he writes again, in Franz Holberg's view, a central feature of biological time structure is that the harmonic relationship that exists 
among the various component frequencies or different types of rhythms is a striking aspect of, uh, that these components themselves appear to be harmonics or subharmonics, multiples or submultiples of seven, which is very interesting, I think. So there are certain testable claims in regard to God's ability to create and manipulate time. Uh, for example, Jesus specifically said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, there's an implied benefit for keeping the Sabbath or for following this pattern of life, right? If you follow this pattern of life, Jesus says that it was made for your benefit. In other words, you should expect to receive some testable benefit that you can actually uh, measure. So, if true, one should expect to find biorhythms that are tuned to this particular weekly pattern of seven-day cycles and to detect a difference in well-being when in or out of this cycle. That's what should be expected if you go from the biblical perspective. This should not be expected, however, if you're a naturalist, right? This could complete surprise from a naturalistic perspective. There's also a specific additional benefit for following the owner's manual, right? If you look at the Bible and read the Bible as our owner's manual, because the Bible tells us about ourselves, about our creator who made us, if you, I mean, if you don't read your owner's manual for your car, and you don't put the proper fuel into your car, are you going to expect your car to run as well? No, right? Why shouldn't we expect the same things for us, from our owner's manual, about who made us, or our designer? In Isaiah 58, 13 to 14, God says, specifically God, Isaiah is quoting God here, he says, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and for doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Right? So this is a promised benefit from living according to the owner's manual of this cyclical pattern. Of course, this is just a claim. Again, the mouth of the Lord has spoken like, okay, tell me another one. Is there any evidence for this? If you're not already convinced that the Bible is true, how are you going to believe this statement? Well, there's lots of evidences that I can't get into. But one of them is the fact, undisputed, this was published in National Geographic a few years ago. Uh, Oprah Winfrey show covered this. There's, what, there's this um, concept called the Blue Zone People. Anybody hear of it? Right? Blue Zone People are the longest lived people in the world. And like the Okinawans, uh, um, <coughs> different places in Japan. And the Adventists. The Adventists are the longest lived people in the world. But what's unique about Adventists versus the other Blue Zone Peoples is that Adventists are ethnically diverse. In other words, we're not just one nationality. We're all kinds of different nationalities in one big melting pot. So we're the longest lived ethnically diverse people in the world. Uh, that should tell you something. And maybe there's some contribution from us observing a weekly cycle, and not only that, a day of rest within that weekly cycle that's specific to the biblical pattern. Uh, specifically on the seventh day, God promises an extra blessing. Um, so then, why does God wish us to know him as such a powerful creator of all that we are, that we have been, and that we ever will be? Why does God want to tell us about himself in this way? Is it just because he wants us to praise him? He's like this egomaniac. He wants all this attention for himself. Or is it for more altruistic motives? I think he tells us about himself, not for himself. He doesn't need all the praise and the glory, right? He already knows who he is. He already knows he's a big shot, right? He tells us about himself for a couple reasons. And one is, I think, to give us hope. To give us hope in the future. Because we're in a pretty tough world, right? We have a lot of bad things happen to us. And if we didn't have this hope in the future that God has it all in control, it'd be a lot harder to live through it, I would think. Ellen White says again in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 43, He that rules in the heavens is the one who sees the end from the beginning, the one before whom the mysteries of the past and the future are alike outspread, and who beyond the woe and darkness and ruin that sin has wrought, beholds the accomplishment of his own purpose of love and blessing. So, while we're waiting, too, while we're still living in this dark place, God gives us another little benefit. He gives us a taste of heaven, which I call the Sabbath. I think the Sabbath is a taste of heaven. It was created before the fall 
And Jesus again said it was made for us, right? So he said in Matthew, Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 and 30, Come to me, all of you are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is rest from all kinds of things, not just from our daily labor, but rest from sin, rest from guilt, rest from uh, stress, rest from all kinds of things. We enter into God's rest when we enter into His Sabbath with the correct spirit. Uh, Hebrews 4, 1 through 11, Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest is st still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all, his, all of his work. Therefore remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Amen.